What do you do for fun? And she said, I play the violin. And he said, that's not fun. What do you do for fun? And she said, it is fun. I love playing the violin. I'm going to be a musician when I grow up. And he said, what's your favorite video game? And she said, I don't play video games. And he said, all kids play video games. And she said, I don't. I play the violin. He said, let me give you some advice. When you're young, don't listen to your teachers. Don't listen to your parents. Run around, make a lot of noise, and have fun. All right. And I'm watching all this very quietly. I don't say a word. We went on the ride. We had a wonderful time. When the ride was over, I called the children over and I said, I feel bad. I know I expect a lot of you. I hope you don't think I'm taking away your fun. It's just that, and before I could finish, one of the 10-year-old children named Catherine said, Rafe, that guy takes tickets for a tourist attraction. Do you really think we're going to listen to him? So these children, at a very early age, have already learned to think about who is giving them information, who is telling them what to do and why they should listen to some people and not other people. This is what six levels can do for a child. And I still get letters from my college students all the time talking about the six levels. Now, I wanted to share with you one other thing that I do, because people always want to know, Rafe, why do your children behave themselves so well? I also think that when I meet my children, that there are three kinds of kids in the world. And in my mind, I put them in three groups. Kid one is the gift from God. Kid one loves school, comes to school and says, I'm glad I'm here. I like school, and Rafe, I like you. My parents like you. My mother runs the laundry, and if you ever need your shirts done, she will do them for you. I'm very smart, and I always get good grades. At the end of the year, when this child does well, People say, Rafe, you did a good job. And I think, not really. This child always does well. Kid one. On the other side is kid three. Kid three is, I hate school and I hate you. I don't want to hear anything you have to say. My father runs a gang and if you give me homework, I will kill you. I have those students in my class, both. I think most teachers spend most of their time with kid one or kid three. They spend time with kid one because it's fun. They get it. Or they spend time with kid three because he is ruining your life and ruining your class and driving you crazy. But I spend 95% of my day with kid two, the average kid. He is not the fastest runner. She is not the best writer. But because they're OK, they get passed through our system from one class to the next, and no one ever notices them. I notice them. In a minute, I'm going to show you a little clip of a kid two kid. Because I notice kid two and I say, did anybody ever tell you you have a beautiful voice? Did anybody ever tell you you write well? And when the children say, well, you do, I think you're going to be a great writer. The kid two starts to feel so great that a someone week noticed before them. The battle of Can we stop this, please? Thank you. Not quite. The, the kid two is so excited, they start behaving like kid one. And now, kid three, 
who wants to be negative in the classroom has no one to talk to because they usually go after kid two. That's why my class behaves themselves. Kid three is all alone, and so he figures, I might as well do what everybody else is doing. That's how my classroom works. And I want to tell you a story about a boy you're going to see right now. I got a phone call several years ago from a strange group in Washington, D.C. called the Heritage Foundation. Their politics are very different from my politics. Very different. They are very George W. Bush, very Ronald Reagan. Okay. I am very Malcolm X, very far the other way, far the other way. And they called me up and they said, Rafe, do your children ever do history presentations? And I said, no. We usually do Shakespeare. And they said, oh, that's too bad. If your class did history presentations, we were going to bring you to Washington, D.C. to give a performance in front of the United States Supreme Court. And I said, oh, history presentations. Of course we do history presentations. We do them all the time because I wanted to go to Washington, D.C. with the children. I hung up the phone, and here's the point of the story. Would you raise your hand if you have been teaching more than 10 years? Where are my heroes here? More than 10 years? Yes, good. I, my challenge to all of you is every year do one new thing. One new thing. Take a chance. Even fail. I had never done history presentation, and I started to research speeches that my students would give in front of the United States Supreme Court. Something amazing happened today, on this day, that I'm going to show you, and as teachers, I know you are going to love this. The boy you are going to see was kid two. No one ever noticed this boy, ever. He came from a very difficult family situation. He never talked in class, ever. He had terrible self-esteem, never joined anything. But I taught him one speech. It came from an American war that we call the Civil War when our country fought each other over slavery. The speech you are about to hear, and you don't have to know about history, that is not the point of this, was written by a soldier before a battle. This soldier wrote home to his wife before a battle explaining why he was fighting. It's a beautiful love letter. It's beautiful. He told her how much he loved her, and he told her that if he was killed in the battle, when the wind blew by her face, it would be him kissing her cheek. This soldier was killed in that battle, and his wife never got the letter. This boy had rehearsed this speech with me 500 times. He was good. But on this day, in front of a thousand people and the United States Supreme Court, talk about pressure. Something happened to this boy. For the first time, the words and what war means and what love means actually got into his soul. Watch the film, because right in the middle, you will see his breathing change. You will see his eyes change. I did not teach him this. People came up to me after what you're about to see and said, Rafe, you're amazing. I didn't do anything. I just took a chance and taught children to think what's inside their behavior as they speak. There was a, a, your great minister of education asked me before, how do the children memorize the words? Don't they ever forget them? No, they don't forget them ever because they aren't just memorizing the words, they are understanding the words on a higher level than children do around the world. Anyway, if you have Kleenex, 
or tissue, you will need it. Let's spend a few minutes with a little boy that nobody ever noticed under pressure in front of the United States Supreme Court. May we show that clip? A week before the Battle of Bull Run, Sullivan Ballou, a major in the second Rhode Island Volunteers, wrote home to his wife in Smithfield. July 14, 1861, Washington, D.C. My dear Sarah, the indications are very strong that we shall, we shall move in a few days, perhaps tomorrow, unless I should not be able to write again. I feel impelled to write a few lines that may fall under your eye when I am no more. I have no misgivings about or lack of confidence in the cause in which I am engaged, and my courage does not halt or falter. I know how the American civilization now leans upon the triumph of the government, and how great a debt we owe to those who went before us through the blood and suffering of the revolution. And I am willing, perfectly willing, to lay down all my joys in this life to help maintain that government, to pay that debt. My dear Sarah, my love for you is deathless. It seems to bind me with mighty cables that nothing but omnipotence can break. And yet, my love of country comes over me like a strong wind and bears me irresistibly with all those chains to the battlefield. And all the blissful moments I've enjoyed with you come crowding over me. And I feel deeply grateful to God and you that I've enjoyed them for so long. And how hard it is for me to give them up and burn to ashes the hopes of future years. When God willing, we could have still lived and loved together and I've seen our boys grow up to honorable manhood around us. If I do not return, my dear Sarah, never forget how much I loved you. Nor that with my last breath escapes me on the battlefield, which shall whisper your name, Sarah. Forgive the many pains that I have caused you. How thoughtless, how foolish I have sometimes been. But oh, Sarah, if the dead can come back to this earth and flit unseen around, around those they love, I shall always be with you. The brightest day and the darkest night. Always, always. And when the soft breeze fans your cheek, shall be my breath, the cool air, your throbbing temple, shall be my spirit passing by. Sarah, do not mourn me dead. Think I'm gone. And wait for me. For we shall meet again. Sullivan Ballou was killed a week later at the First Battle of Bull Run. When people say that we teachers don't get paid a lot, they are wrong. We are paid a lot. On that day, you can't see, everybody in the room was crying, including the judges. I had nothing to do with this. It was not planned, but I took a chance on a kid too. I hope all of you will start to really look at the kids that we don't notice in school. That boy today graduated college and his major was history. And it all started right there. The last thing I wanted to share with you is that I know that all of us get our children ready for tests. The famous test at the end of the year. And we are under pressure. 